Welcome, everybody, to the Keto Edge Summit. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers, and we are dispelling the myths and helping empower you to get a super edge in life through the ketogenic lifestyle. I've got a great guest on today. This is Dr. Justin Markajani. And really, I brought Dr. Justin on because he is an expert when it comes to autoimmune cases, thyroid, and hormones in general, and really one of the pioneers in the functional medicine world. And it's a, it's just a really controversial topic in the ketogenic world, which is, is a ketogenic lifestyle good for thyroid health or not? And we're going to dive into that in detail. And so, Dr. Justin, you can find him at Justin Health. Dot com. He's got an incredible podcast and YouTube channel as well. I know some of the top doctors, including myself, we listen to him all the time because he's constantly bringing great content to the world. And uh, I know I'm constantly learning new things from him. And uh, ultimately, we're all working together here to help more people get well. And uh, Dr. Justin's really a leader in this in this area. And uh, Dr. Justin, really excited to have you on and, and to dive into this topic of the ketogenic lifestyle and thyroid health. Dr. David, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, really excited. I've been following you since 2012 and following your great articles and great information and I share with my patients all the time. So it is a pleasure to be here and I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really an honor to, to hear you say that. You're somebody I've looked up to in this field, so that is awesome. And I know, uh, Dr. Justin, you've got your own story about how you got into natural health, and uh, you had a thyroid issue. And this is really one of the reasons why I brought you on, is because you know you've had this history of thyroid problems, and um, you know, and you're still following a ketogenic lifestyle. We're going to talk about how you do that and really go into more detail about that. But first, share with us your story about how you got into natural health and uh, and some of the struggles you've dealt with. Excellent question. So I, I wanted to go to conventional medical school. I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon at one point. I, I worked in a surgical center throughout undergraduate years. And I was the person that would go into the operating room and that would literally hold the limbs on the diabetic patients as they would be cut off. So the sur surgeon would come in, they tie off the arteries and the veins, they pull out the surgical saw and I'd be there as they're literally sawing their way through. We'd wrap it up, we'd bring the, the limb down to the morgue. And I can't tell you how many countless body parts came through my possession Wow. And how this connects to natural medicine is the surgeons really weren't looking to get ahead of it and figure out what was causing it. They were just treating the effects of it. I mean, they were well-intentioned, but we know that, you know, in functional medicine world and kind of a paleo template slash ketogenic approach, we can reverse a lot of these things. And so I was thinking, let's get ahead of this. Let's prevent this. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Conventional medicine really isn't uh, too engaged at fixing that, but we are. And that's what really inspired me trying to get ahead of this thing and come up with a lasting natural solution. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you struggled with Hashimoto's as well. Is that correct? Yeah, so I, I definitely have some elevated Hashimoto antibodies, TPO and thyroglobulin. They kind of bounce yep. back and forth, keeping kind of on a lower carbish kind of autoimmune paleo slash paleo template yep. and keeping the carbohydrates in that ketogenic realm where I can spit out close to one millimoles of uh, ketones yep. tends to be where I feel the best. And again, mm. we'll talk about it today. Insulin's a really important hormone for thyroid activation or thyroid yep. conversion. So it's kind of the Goldilocks effect, not too much, but not too little, most people tend to be more insulin resistant because of the prolific increase of carbohydrates and refined sugar over the last 100 years. We went from four pounds in 1905 to 140 pounds in 2005. Yeah. And we know if people like you, people like you and me aren't average at 140, 150. So if we're low, someone else has yeah. to be going 300, 400 pounds of refined sugar. So most people, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of people are going to benefit by getting their insulin levels under control. And I look at a ketogenic paleo template approach as the biggest vehicle to stimulate that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's it's this controversial topic that we want to dive into. And I want you to really explain more detail about what the thyroid does for our body. Like what is what does the thyroid do? And um, also ways that you test the thyroid, what you're looking for on labs and symptoms that somebody may experience that uh, could trigger off in your head, hey, this person might have a thyroid problem. 
That's a phenomenal question. So your thyroid is right here. It's like kind of that bow tie gland right here, just about a centimeter or so uh, below your Adam's apple, right? This thyroid cartilage here, and then just a little bit lateral. That's going to be your thyroid gland, and it's kind of the center of your metabolism. Think of it as like the thermostat of your body. And your thyroid produces the hormone called T4, tetraiodothyronine, which is an inactive thyroid hormone. That hormone has to go through these steps to get converted via these D1, D2, D3 enzymes. These enzymes typically are selenium-based, but we need other things to make that conversion happen. We need basically a certain amount of cortisol and insulin, and these I call it the Goldilocks effect, not too much cortisol, not too much stress hormones, and not too much insulin, sugar, you know, excess sugar storing hormones. So we need not too much, not too little. And many people we know they're stressed, so their cortisol's either out of balance high or the rhythm's dysregulated. We know that excess carbohydrates, especially refined sugar and grains, drives up the insulin resistance. Yeah. And we know the nutrient density in the diet super low. So nutrients like selenium and zinc and vitamin A and copper and magnesium and tyrosine amino acids are really low. So we're having these inability of these nutrients to help convert that thyroid hormone T4 to T3, which is a triiodothyronine. And T3s are a more active thyroid hormone. And we know other components like healthy liver function is so important. And we know health, we know things like gut bacteria balance is so important. The enzymes in the healthy gut bacteria help activate that thyroid conversion, as well as adrenal function, right? We will convert more reverse T3 from our thyroid yeah. hormone, and reverse T3 are metabolic blanks in the gun. It's like putting a bullet in the gun, you pull the trigger, you get a loud noise but no bullet comes out and that's what reverse t3 is it's a it's a cone in that parking spot when you're trying to park there you can't park your car there right absolutely yep and so what have you found to be the major causes of thyroid imbalances and also let's talk about some symptoms that people experience i know for me as a doctor one of the big questions i ask is do you feel cold often are you having trouble losing weight? Do you have hair thinning, particularly the outer third of the eyebrows? What are some other things that you look for with, uh, with thyroid symptoms? Great question. So off the bat, we're going to see obviously your conventional cold hands, cold feet, right? That's that's yeah. common. We're going to see outer third thinning of the eyebrows, okay? We're going to see thinning of the hair. A lot of times we can see depression and anxiety. Yeah. They found T3 therapy, giving T3 hormone more effective than giving antidepressants and lithium for mood right. disorders. So we know the thyroid is so important for mood. We know thyroid can be an important component of SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because thyroid hormones important for activating the migrating motor complex okay right. what, what does that mean imagine you got a toothpaste tube and you're like kind of working the end and rolling it up to get the toothpaste out your intestines create these wave-like contractions that move stool out of your body and that's a thyroid hormone dependent so you can have constipation and, and digestive and motility issues with low thyroid hormone of course uh, irritability poor sleep poor mood all of these things can be affected with thyroid hormone imbalances and again hormones function and dysfunction together so when you typically have a thyroid issue almost always there's some kind of adrenal issue and almost always yep. there's some kind of a hormone issue because progesterone is really important for activating that thyroid peroxidase enzyme mm. which binds iodine and tyrosine to make those hormones to make the the t4 and then help the t4 and t3 activation as well yeah absolutely and Really what you're saying, and it's kind of what I try to explain to my patients too. Oftentimes somebody has a thyroid problem or they have thyroid symptoms. It's oftentimes not really an issue with the thyroid gland itself. Sometimes it can be, right? But it's typically an issue with the immune system, the liver, the brain communicating to the thyroid, the gut, right? And so we've got to look at really all these different symptoms. And so what would you say that you found, and you've been working with thousands of, of patients with thyroid issues, what have you found that have been really the, the major underlying factors with thyroid problems? All right, awesome. So first off, autoimmunity is number one. Most thyroid issues, some research study back in 89 says 80% to 90% are autoimmune issues. Some say 50%. I test everyone for thyroid antibodies at least two times in the first couple of months if there's a thyroid symptoms present. I don't find 90% have it personally, but I find yeah. definitely upwards of 25 to 50%. But some of the research says there's a 40% false negative, meaning it comes back right. negative, but it's really positive. So yeah. I would say the the majority is autoimmune. 
Okay, that's number one. And we know certain things can affect autoimmunity. Number one being a leaky gut, all right? Leaky gut yeah. is basically, here's your, your healthy um, gut lining here. Here are the epithelial junctions in the gut. And when that starts to unzip, like you unzip your jacket on a hot day, food yeah. particles can get through there and create an immune response. Also, things like gluten and grains can unzip that. It does it by increasing zonulin, which is basically the yeah. basically pulls down the zipper to get that gut more permeable. Things like lipo polysaccharides from dysbiosis overgrowth or SIBO can open that gut. Casein as well. Dairy proteins can create inflammation. So the foods can really drive it. Um, we also know infections can drive that autoimmune leaky gut reaction. H. pylori, blastocystis hominis, Yersinia enterocolitica, uh, Entamoeba histolytica, you know, all these different parasites and bug, Lyme or Borrelia burgdorferi, all these, these infections can really drive that leaky gut. And that's yep. just the immune issues that drive the autoimmune immune imbalance yeah absolutely and, and that's a big thing with this and I'm, I'm with you i don't typically see i mean I, it's probably about 20 to 25 percent that i see with high antibodies but i pretty much treat every single person has has a thyroid issue and really in general almost every person i work with i treat yeah. them as if they had an autoimmune condition because 100%. as you know chronic inflammation is really you know it's 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 an immune response and so whether you see the antibodies or not it's one of the best things we can do is start to heal the gut start to address some of these underlying factors and so what are some of the steps you like to take like somebody comes into your clinic um, or you're working with them long distance and you know here they are standard american diet okay they come in to see you right and you know they have all the symptoms of thyroid problems. Where do where do you like to start? So we What's work your at profession the too. What's your yeah. profession? Yeah, great question. We work at that foundational level. And what that does is we're trying to reduce inflammation. So we're cutting out the refined omega-6 oils. We're cutting out the grains. We're getting the carbohydrates in the right range. And for most people, that's going to be a ketogenic kind of lower-carb, nutrient-dense, anti-inflammatory, low-toxin eating plan. And we can talk about where – where it's the best and where it may not be the yeah. best later too. So that's where we start and that drives nutrition up, that drives the fat soluble vitamin A up, that um, think of healthy fats and proteins are metabolic logs on your fire, okay? If anyone goes camping, you never start a fire long term with just twigs and kindling and gas. The fire is gonna go up and out. Right, you'll you'll look good for a second, and then it's gone. Most people start their metabolic fire that way with relatively lower proteins or lower fats or poor quality fats in their diet. That's like throwing kindling right. twigs and, and paper on the fire. It's up and out. And every time that fire goes up and out, there's a cascade of insulin and cortisol and adrenaline and various interleukins and cytokines that happen as this up and down stress response occurs. And your hormones have to internally buffer it out. So we try to fix that. And that's where emphasizing the healthy fats and the proteins and dialing in the nutrient dense, glycemically appropriate carbohydrates, meaning carbs that don't throw the blood sugar up and down. So that's number one. Uh, number two, we're going to start looking at the hormonal systems that, that drive whatever's going on. So, of course, the adrenals are so important because the adrenals are the interplay between the, the nervous system and the, the, basically the sympathetic nervous system in the outer world. So, you know, sure. as chiropractors, we would adjust patients to help with that sympathetic tone to decrease the fight or flight response and to increase the parasympathetic right. rest and digest. We also can have major effects by supporting the adrenal glands, which are the interplay between the central nervous system, our brain and our spine, and the outer stressors in our environment. So if we can get the adrenals under control with blood sugar stability, with certain nutrients, with figuring out where the cortisol rhythm is, how that cortisol fluctuates, we can buffer and support that with botanicals, herbs, various nutrients, sure. maybe even hormone precursors, which can basically essentially give you a metabolic crutch so you can take pressure off those glands so you can start to heal. Yeah, absolutely. That's, so that's, I mean, that's a great point. start. So we start with the nutrition, then you start to address those hormone systems. Meanwhile, then you, you might be doing further testing, trying to find root causes. I know you're big, trying to find the infections, right? But big first, time. you're preparing the body, right? Got to prepare the body and, and strengthen the body. So that way, when you go in to try to maybe kill off an infection or something like that, it's strong enough to heal. 
Totally. Yeah. And we'll look at thyroid. If we see a lot of thyroid symptoms there or female or male hormone mm -hmm. symptoms, we'll run those too. And right. sometimes we'll see it's, it's just the thyroid. There's a serious yeah. autoimmune issue, but the adrenals and the other hormones are doing good. Or sometimes it's most of the time it's all three, yeah. but usually one's together. a little bit, one's a little bit more out of balance. And we'll see that more when people have thyroid antibodies for a long time, all these little right. follicles where, where there's, you know, each little follicle, imagine if you look at a little raspberry there's little follicles on each little part of the raspberry imagine you get a little toothpick in there and you burst it that's what your little antibodies are doing you get little b cells they infiltrate in there and they start yep. attacking that thyroid tissue that follicle and hormone spills out so a lot of people can feel hyper right anxious anxiety irritability heart palpitation excessive sweating they feel more hyper before they go hypo because those follicles have to empty out Right, absolutely. And so let's kind of jump into this this controversy of ketogenic diet and thyroid health. And so a lot of people will say, well, if we're on a ketogenic diet, right, insulin is going down, right? And oftentimes for some people, right, they're saying, hey, cortisol is jumping up. And if you have high cortisol, it's going to increase that reverse T3, uh, which is basically an inactive thyroid hormone. And so therefore, you're going to get more RT3 binding to T3 receptors, and you're not going to get the same T3 activity at the cell. And so you can start to have more symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. And so I think you and I probably have seen that with other people, and we've seen it on yep. lab tests, right? And so how do you start to address that uh, you know, with, with a ketogenic or a low-carb lifestyle? And how do you kind of cycle in carbs, or what are your strategies working with people with this? Great. So let me go back and kind of just walk through the history of the ketogenic diet and how it mm -hmm. all started. So first we had in the late 1800s, William Banting. He's the one that kind of, you know, pioneered a, a lower carbohydrate diet. And remember, you know, back in the late 1800s, there were no GMOs. Everything was organic, right? Everything came from local farms. There wasn't this massive factory farming scales and all these different things and all these pesticides. So the nutrient density was higher, okay? Then we yeah. had Dr. Robert Atkins, cardiologist in the 70s, kind of, you know, re-emerge it and basically the ketogenic diet fell on a lot of things by accident so by cutting out carbohydrates and really focusing on generating ketones which are metabolites of fatty acids to generate an alternative fuel source to glucose they stumbled on a couple of things by cutting out carbohydrates they cut out a whole bunch of anti or a whole bunch of inflammatory foods by accident just because they were higher in carbohydrates yeah. so they cut out grains they cut out a lot of things that weren't so good uh, a lot of them added some things back in accidentally. I mean, if you look at what Atkins, you know, promoted for a while, Splenda, aspartame, soy proteins, you know, not so good fatty acids. We know today yeah. with a paleo template approach, we really work on the nutrient density, really work on the fat quality. So kind of the ketogenic diet accidentally stumbled on some things that tend to drive inflammation, tend to drive autoimmunity. OK, so then today now we've updated that template and like you talk about, you know, in some of your articles on refined sugar or uh, artificial sweeteners, right? Those aren't good. That affects gut bacteria. We talked about earlier how gut bacterium balance and that sulfatase enzyme is so important for T4 to T3 activation. So we've updated that approach. Some of the studies out there that show lower carbohydrate ketogenic diets actually weaken the thyroid hormone. If you go and you break down the composition of the fatty acids they use, you're going to see an excessive amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids. That right. tends to be the driving factor in why some of these studies show ketogenic diets make the thyroid worse is the excess amount of polyunsaturated. So of course, we're emphasizing saturated fats yep. more than, than unsaturated fats. So we have our saturated fats, coconut oil, grass-fed meat, ghee, grass-fed butter, all your animal fats, your tallow, right, bacon fat. We have our monounsaturated fats, which are still great. You know, avocados yep. are phenomenal. Um, olive oil is great, just don't cook it. And then we have our polyunsaturated fats, which would be our fish oils. And then of course you got the more junky high omega-6, safflower, right. canola, those kind of things. So if we really emphasize the right fatty acids on a uh -huh. ketogenic diet, we can really uh, drive and promote healthy thyroid function. But there are times where it may not be enough. And we, we can go into that next. I'll, I'll take a breath for you and give you a chance to respond. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And so a lot of times, and, and you brought up a good topic there too, is saturated fat. So a lot of people think saturated fat's bad, but actually saturated fat's the most stable fat we can put in our body, right? Meaning that it's less prone to oxidation. And we know that oxidative stress is, you know, a driving factor with inflammation, damages all of our tissues. And so when we put in these polyunsaturated fats, like you were talking about corn oils, sunflower oils, soybean oil, all these types of things, if we're doing high amounts of that, 
are really even in small amounts. I mean, we're just going to just cause more oxidation in our body, more rusting, whereas the saturated fats are real Big stable. Time. So the saturated fats, there's less rusting, less oxidation, very easy for our body to metabolize, um, just really easy. And the monounsaturates, they're less prone to oxidation as well. So those are really the fats that we want to be using. That's really why people say, hey, you know, you should cook with coconut oil. And you and I, we teach our patients, cook with coconut oil, cook with grass-fed ghee, uh, grass-fed butter, you know, things like that because they're really, really stable fats. And that's what we're looking there for their stability. We don't want to introduce more things that are going to create oxidative stress in our system like these polyunsaturated fats do. And that's really why when you're looking at those studies, if we're doing high amounts of polyunsaturated fats, we're going to cause more inflammation in our body, even if insulin goes down because of the amount of oxidation that they're causing. So as we uh, as we kind of transition, hey, we want to look at like what are what are some factors if somebody's following a ketogenic diet. We know that in general, inflammation is going to go down, right? Because insulin's going down, blood sugar's more stable. So if inflammation goes down, thyroid health should improve. Like we should get better T4 to T3 conversion. We should have a better brain to thyroid communication pattern. We should get better T3 expression at the cell. What would be some reasons why somebody may not feel as good when they're doing that, or at least you know er early on and before they really understand uh, the best strategies with a ketogenic diet? What are, what are some of the uh, what are some reasons why somebody may may struggle with that if they have a thyroid problem? Great question. So let me just dovetail on one thing when you're talking about the um, the uh, oxidative stress. I want to just dovetail one thing. Yeah. So, Everyone's listening. They're thinking oxidation. What the hell is oxidation? Okay, oxidation <laughs> is nothing more than a loss in electrons. You are losing yeah. electrons. That's all it is. Now, what does that mean in real world? Cut an apple open, leave it on the table. It gets brown. It's losing right. electrons. The, the nail outside, it gets rusty. It loses electrons. Okay, what does that do? So in your body, every cell has a lipid bilayer, and it has to stabilize that lipid bilayer uh, with various antioxidants. So when you do too much polyunsaturated, what happens is lipid peroxidation and your body has to use antioxidants, anti-loss of electron compounds like vitamin C and various other nutrients, curcumin's also there, and that yep. stabilizes that cell membrane. So a lot of people, they are, they are pulling and they're losing their antioxidant reserves, and these antioxidants are also really important for thyroid and adrenal health. So imagine you have a poor diet, you're not getting a lot of these nutrients in, you're eating fats that cause your reserves of these nutrients to go lower. So now you got this major debt because you're, you're paying people on both sides of the fence and you don't have enough income of nutrients coming in to pay that metabolic debt. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. That's a great, so, great example. Yep. Perfect. So getting back to your question, I want to make sure I answered it. So with a ketogenic diet, again, the benefit of it off the bat is if there's any insulin resistance happening, you're going to help with that insulin resistance. Okay, You're going to see a, D4, a T4 to T3 conversion. A, a, those D1, D2, D3 enzymes down regulate because of high amounts of insulin. So we can get those, we can get our receptor sites more sensitive to insulin so we need less of it to get the job done, which helps with that T4 to T3 conversion. Version. Now, what does that? What does insulin resistance mean from a objective level? So, I like to see insulin levels, a fasting insulin, closer to five or so, two to five, three to five, on your fasting insulin blood test. I like to see a functional glucose tolerance, not a glucose tolerance where they give you 75 grams of a sugar drink that you would never do in real life, but an actual meal. I like to yeah. do a fasting, and then a one hour, two hour, three hour. Make sure we keep it, you know, 140 within one. My goal is 120, 140 yeah. to 120 within one. You know, back below 120. 20 within two and back below 100 and ideally you know 75 to 95 is kind of the sweet spot that tells me that my body's able to get that glucose down the more that glucose stays higher the more oxidative damage we cause the more ages or advanced glycation M yep. products happen. And I can't tell you, I would see, I remember I knew blood sugar was such an important thing because I remember I was 22 years old and I was wheeling a 28 year old gentleman down who was blind. And I, I couldn't wrap my head around how this guy was blind. You think, oh, maybe a trauma. And I said, well, can you walk me through your history? He's like, well, I have a blood sugar over 800. So wow. he had such oh oxidative gosh. damage yeah. and glycation to all these microvascular, you know, arterials to the eyes where he lost his sight. So I knew early on that blood sugar was super important. And these doctors, I mean, they were just focused on, you know, getting his insulin levels, getting insulin injections up to lower it and get him on more drugs like metformin or glucophage. They were not interested in making diet or lifestyle changes to fix it. So I knew early on that we got to get our arms wrapped around this. So. 
that's why those are kind of my objective markers. They I'll take a breath and I'll go into when maybe a ketogenic diet may hurt the thyroid. I'll go into that next. I'll give you a second though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's one of the tragedies that we see is that, hey, people are coming in diabetics, right? They're getting medications, but never nobody's actually getting to the root cause. And you know, the nutrition that they give them when they meet with their dietitian, it's typically high carb, right? So oftentimes they're trying to steer them towards more whole grains, which I guess would be somewhat better. But nevertheless, you know, they still allow a lot of processed foods. Artificial sweeteners are a huge component of, the, of it. And so really that's sort of a diet is is highly inflammatory for the body. So just like you were talking about, when we start to go on a ketogenic lifestyle, we're going to get more stability in our blood sugar. And blood sugar imbalances, when we eat a meal and it jumps way up, like you were talking about, blood sugar is jumping up over 120 after a meal. I mean, we know that a blood sugar over 120 reduces your phagocytic index, which is basically the ability of your white blood cells to chew up bacteria, viruses, abnormal cells that are growing in the body. It reduces it by 75%, right? And so a lot, a lot of people may not have have a fasting blood sugar, like when they wake up in the morning, their blood sugar might not be 120, but after a meal for an hour or two hours after, their blood sugar oftentimes is over uh, 120, and sometimes for three plus hours after a meal. And so what happens there? It just completely de depletes our immune system. We get a whole bunch of different inflammatory uh, molecules, cytokines and whatnot that come out, yep, creates more exactly. inflammation in the body. We get these advanced glycolytic enzymes, these AGEs, which do exactly what that acronym says, which Bingo. basically accelerates the aging process of every tissue of our body, our kidneys, our liver, our gut, uh, are, like you were talking about, really, really bad for, for nerve endings, damages our nerves, uh, damages the, the, the cardiovascular system, all the little blood vessels. So it more or less just completely destroys our body and accelerates the aging process. So when we go on that ketogenic lifestyle, we start to lower and stabilize the blood sugar. We reduce all that AGE uh, development in our body. We also preserve our body's own natural antioxidants. So like when we're consuming antioxidants from our diet, because we've got less oxidative stress, now we're able to preserve those antioxidants and really use them where, you know, for, for things that are more necessary, where they're, where they're more necessary, right? We want to have that kind of antioxidant reserve in our system. So we're able to do that as well. And then there's a need, you know, we have less of a need for antioxidant supplements when we start to adapt like that and keep our blood sugar more stable. So with that said, what, how about somebody that maybe is, has struggled with thyroid issues? Maybe they're taking thyroid medication. Maybe they don't even have a thyroid, right? And so uh, what, what are some techniques and strategies you'll use other than getting their blood sugar stable, right? And maybe where the challenges they may have um, with a ketogenic lifestyle as they go through this. So a lot of people who express insulin resistance, you know, some of the markers that I mentioned, higher levels of fasting insulin, let's say seven or higher, let's say a functional glucose tolerance test that's, you know, ab out of that range that I mentioned. Let's say a waist size of 40 inches for a male, 35 for a female. Because remember, your tummy is kind of your insulin meter, insulin slash cortisol yeah. meter. Those are all important markers for insulin resistance. So if you're listening at home thinking, well, is that me? Well, those are some couple of objective measures you can look at. That's number one. Most people, when they start to get their insulin levels more, more sensitive, they start to activate and convert thyroid hormone better. Now, there's some point where some people, they may hit the wall where they may drive their insulin levels too low for what their needs are. And again, when I say needs, that means stress, emotional stress, all right, work, family, and that also means physical stress. If you're doing CrossFit or doing more glycolytic activities, that's carbohydrate burning yeah. activities, you may need to gently taper up those carbohydrates over time. So how I do with my patients is we monitor symptoms, we monitor, we monitor thyroid levels, because sometimes we'll see all those thyroid symptoms start to improve as they become more insulin sensitive. And then there may be a point where we hit the wall. And then wherever that wall is, let's say the hair start, hair loss starts to happen. Yeah. Fatigue starts to happen, cold hands, cold feet, mood issues. We gently up the carbohydrate primarily at night because that's where people tend to be yep. more insulin sensitive. They've done studies where they've taken, let's just say, 200 grams of carbohydrate. It's just an odd number. And they spread it out evenly throughout the day. So let's say 66, 66, 66, three meals a day. That's one group. Second group, same amount of carbohydrates all at night now. 
And they found the groups that took all that carbohydrate primarily at night and not during the day had a significant difference in weight loss. So it seems that we're more sensitive at nighttime. So I recommend doing the carbohydrates that you, if you're going to taper it up, add it at night. Yeah. And that, and that may be like a half of a small medium sweet potato or half of a medium sweet potato, right? That's yeah. is one starting point, maybe a couple of berries in there. And typically, you know, 10 grams of carbohydrate added per week till you find that sweet spot. And what does that mean? Cold hands and cold feet get a little better. Hair loss improves, mood improves, brain fog improves, but we do it very methodically. And again, it may not be yeah. like now you need 300 grams of carbohydrate. It may be, hey, now you were at 30 to 50 net carbs. Now you need 75, yeah, right? Now absolutely. you need 90, right? So again, yeah. it's not like, you know, we're still in the ballpark. Most people would even still consider that kind of carbohydrate level, still lower carbohydrate most. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you know what I found is that a lot of people will will start on a ketogenic diet, and I've worked with people like this, and they'll get into ketosis, and they'll be in that zone, right, and consuming typically less than 30 grams of net carbs, and then maybe a few months down the road, they'll start to have issues, thyroid-type symptoms, or losing their hair, fatigue, things like that. And, uh, you know, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. So it's like, okay, if we start to notice that, let's start to tighter up those carbohydrates, go up 10 yeah. grams per week and see if that's our sweet spot. Because a lot of people say, yep. you know what, I was on the ketogenic diet, I felt good, then all of a sudden I started having these symptoms. It didn't work for me, right? And what you're saying is, hey, it, it probably worked for a period of time, right? You started to feel Bingo. better with down-regulating inflammation, but you gotta find your sweet spot where those carbs should be. And so start adding in 10 grams per week, like he was saying, and kind of find where where's that spot where you feel really good, where you're able to kind of go four or five plus hours throughout the day without feeling hungry and having cravings. But at the same time, you don't have the thyroid symptoms. You're not losing your hair. You've got good, stable energy throughout the day. Your brain's functioning really well. And this is pretty much what you're saying here. Bingo. And some people may even do good just keeping at that ketogenic level, but every yeah. three to five days, they just have a really higher carb day. Right. And that may be a, a good approach. So we try to yeah. cater it to each person. I tend to do that. I mean, most part, like this morning, I've had, you know, 20 grams of collagen peptides, a whole bunch of fat and butter and MCT. Yeah. And then lunch today for me will probably be some tuna fish, some, some, uh, some primal mayo, and then maybe some sauerkraut and spinach. And then tonight, I'll do the same thing, non-starchy vegetable meat, and then my dessert will be, you know, some dark chocolate and some raspberries. Like keep right. it like that, and I keep it primarily yep. at nighttime. And then maybe I'll have a higher carb day in there if I'm doing a lot more exercise. I save my higher carb days for more intense exercise. Yeah, absolutely, and, and this makes a lot of sense. Like Dr. Pompa, who's another one of our interviews, he's a real big fan of feast famine, right? Which is really what I apply as well, where it's like, hey, if you cycle in more of a feasting day, when we're consuming more carbs, we're telling our body, hey, food is prevalent, right? That uh, we're around a lot of food, which is really what our ancestors did. It wasn't like they were trying to get into ketosis. They would just cycle into it, uh, basically because food wasn't available, right? When food was available, they eat a lot of it, right? And that's kind of what we're trying to do here, where, hey, we bump up the carbs maybe once once a week, maybe once every two weeks for somebody that you know that maybe has a little bit more adrenal thyroid issues, right? And they find that they they respond better there. But we're keeping it as a low carb, just kind of a low carb uh, base, right? In a sense, a template like you were talking about that paleo keto template as we go forward with this. And, Perfect. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. So. With that being said, I know we've talked a lot about uh, a lot about thyroid health. What are some? What would you say are the top top ten foods that uh, somebody with a thyroid issue should really focus on? Top ten foods uh, that are going to help them. Oh, great. Well, so off the bat, I'll, I'll steal from your top 20 ketogenic foods that you yeah. put out a month or two ago. So, of course, um, avocados are going to be great. I love them yeah. because they are the highest source of potassium out there, right? People think bananas when it comes to potassium. Uh, I think avocados, about one gram per avocado. Again, potassium is super important because we have that sodium-potassium pump that's really kind of how our cells work and create energy. And we got to make sure we're getting that 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. That's number one. Um, number two, I would say as long as you've done an autoimmune template first, if there's an autoimmune thyroid issue, ghee or high-quality grass-fed butter. 
Okay, yeah. you're going to get medium chain, short chain, uh, short chain uh, triglycerides via butyric acid. You're also going to get a lot of vitamin K2, which is great for bone health as well. Mm -hmm. So that'd be number two. Uh, number three, of course, grass-fed. You know, beef is going to be phenomenal. You get that conjugated linoleic acid. You yeah. get some good omega threes and great saturated fat in there. And if it's grass-fed, you're going to get a lot better, uh, friendlier fatty acid profile. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number number four, I would say here, I would say high quality fish. So like wild Alaskan sockeye is phenomenal. Omega-3 fatty acids. I love that. Um, number six here, I would say egg yolks, eggs in general, pasture-fed eggs. Again, if you're on an autoimmune shtick, you'd pull those out for a bit of time. Yeah. If you're reintroducing, start with egg yolks. Keep them soft. If you can handle the whites, even better. Don't cook the, the crap out of them. That creates more oxidation, right? So try to keep them a little bit more wet or you know poached is, is good too. I'd say that's number six. I would say number seven here, we talked about all our various meats. I would say like healthy chicken thighs or your chicken with the skin yeah. on. The chicken skin is gonna be phenomenal because of all of the um, amazing compounds in there. I would say number seven would be collagen, whether it's from bone broth or collagen peptides, which is really connective tissue amino acid support, which is yeah. great for hair, for skin, for nails. Uh, the type of amino acid profile in there is less gluconeogenic, so your body will spit out less glucose from those amino acids, which is great. I would say number eight, depending on kind of where you're at on um, inflammation, healthy quality nuts and seeds would be great. Pumpkin seeds are going to be excellent for worm killers and very high in zinc. Yeah. Uh, cashews, almonds, those kind of things. As long as you can tolerate it, of course, we can do things to soak them, to, to, to deactivate oxalates and, and various phytates and mineral blockers. So I would say that's next. Uh, bacon. I mean, who doesn't like bacon? Just make sure it's pasture pork. Yeah. Um, you know, we got to make sure the chemical, you know, the, all the uh, pesticides, again, a lot of the pesticides that are used, they're organochlorine based. And if you just type in organochlorines and T3 levels, there's, there's studies showing that organochlorine pesticides lower T3 levels. And a big article came out last week. They're actually feeding cows, right? For, you know, cows, they're feeding them the uh, Skittles that did not pass. The, the, the mustard. So all the dysfunctional Skittles, the candy industry is wow. selling them back to the the, the farmers wow. to feed them to their huh. cows, which is absolutely crazy. Yep. Crazy, crazy. And obviously it's going to fatten them up, which is what the farmers want. But clearly, you know, it's nutrient lists. And so now that just creates massive inflammatory meat and dairy products. And that's why it's so important that we get grass fed, organic, pasture raised. You know, I always tell my clients, number one thing that we want to change in your diet is definitely the meat. We want to reduce carbs. We want to change the meat and the animal products. Make sure it's grass fed, organic. Totally. And again, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit, meaning you got to have yeah. health. You got your animals have to eat healthy, nutrient dense foods for the meat to be healthy and nutrient dense and anti inflammatory. Yeah. So we got to make sure your animals are eating good, too. And then last but not least, I would say our non starchy vegetables. I'll kind of put yeah. a big category there. A lot of polyphenols, antioxidants, good, yep. good fiber, diendol, methane, indol, three carbon, all great compounds yeah, to help metabolize veggies. estrogen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and again, just be careful. Don't do too many raw because they are goitrogenic. They can block iodine uh, right. if you do a, a ton of raw. But don't yep. ever let that stop you from consuming them. Just cook them and yes. saute them or steam them, and that'll yep. break down some of those goitrogens. Yeah, yeah, and, and absolutely. And you think about broccoli, cauliflower, I mean, especially broccoli, right? But hey, cauliflower as well, these cruciferous vegetables, they have a really hard outer fiber, really hard outer cellulose. It's tough on the digestive system anyway. So when you lightly steam it, you remove a lot of those goitrogens. Plus it makes it softer and easier to consume. So I mean, steamed broccoli with grass fed butter on it and herbs just tastes absolutely amazing. Squeeze some lemon Huge. over it. You do cauliflower mashed potatoes, right? This is a great way because now we've broken that down and we've removed a lot of those goitrogens. We've broken down the fibers. It's a lot easier for the body to, to break down and digest. And so, and Dr. Justin, it's been an awesome interview. Really loved it. We've dived into really a cyclical ketogenic diet, which is what he's talking about there, where, hey, we find our sweet zone. We, we go on that low-carb template, right? We start to reduce that insulin sensitivity, get better balance with our blood sugar. We kind of find out what level of carbs that we, uh, we want to be in. 
right? Just by adding in about 10 grams per week, kind of seeing yeah. what, what happens with your symptoms, how you respond with that. And uh, one last question for you before we uh, wrap up here. When somebody's introducing carbs, what are some of the top sources, like most nutrient dense sources that are higher carb foods that they should be looking at? A oh, great question. So off the bat, we've already kind of we're maxing out our non-starchy carbs. It's hard to get more than 50 of non-starchy because, you know, for yeah. every six, you know, for every, let's say a cup of broccoli is six grams. It's really only three grams net. And I don't worry about net carbohydrate if it's coming from non-starchy sources. I only worry about it if you're doing a whole bunch of xylitol and sugar alcohol because then that yeah. can be a little bit wonky because your your taste buds taste sugar, but it's not registering in the body as sugar. So I, that's where I, I get a little bit careful with that. Mm -hmm. um, so carbohydrates are going to be sweet potatoes, uh, plantains, um, cassava or yuca are also great sources. Yeah. Uh, squash is phenomenal, and those are the big ones that I do. You can also add parsnips or rutabaga, and if I do sweet potatoes, I also do some high-quality grass-fed butter, do some yeah. sea salt, and a little bit of cinnamon because one of the articles that you wrote recently is really emphasizing yeah. a lot of these herbs and seasonings in a ketogenic yes. approach to really get the antioxidants up. And I, So I love that, and I've been doing more of that as well for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And all those herbs, those herbs are so good for the gut too. They're carminatives. So they really yes. help with that mi migrating motor complex. Uh, really yes. good for downregulating, you know, gas production and just kind of keeping our gut microbiome in order. So, and they taste good, right? They really help with that. Plus things like cinnamon, really good for blood sugar stability, you know, really helps enhance our body's ability to utilize the sugar. So if we're taking in something like a starchy vegetable, like sweet potato or squash, our blood sugar naturally is gonna go up because there's starchy carbohydrates in there. What we wanna do is modulate that, right? Where we get this little bit of a rise, but not a real big spike, right? And just kind of yeah. rise it up at a slower rate. And, and something like adding grass-fed butter to your sweet potato, along with doing cinnamon on that, not only yep. does it taste better, but it's gonna help modulate that blood sugar response. Yep. Exactly. And I just want to kind of summarize for everyone because if you if you have a thyroid issue all you know already there may be a little bit of brain fog and we just dropped some serious knowledge bombs here. So let yeah. me kind of distill it and break it down. So step 1, get that good kind of paleo kind of ketogenic template going, emphasizing nutrient density, anti-inflammatory, low toxins. That's number one. Number two, get your hormonal system assessed. Figure out what's happening with your thyroid. Is it just a thyroid conversion issue? Is it an autoimmune issue? Is it a conversion issue caused by uh, adrenal or other hormone imbalances? Is there an infection that's driving autoimmunity? Is your has your thyroid been chronically attacked for so long by your immune system where you may need a little bit of thyroid hormone to replace what's missing? A lot of convent, a lot of natural docs, I think, rely too much on natural things, which you know, mm -hmm. thyroid hormone is natural, but they may need to add in thyroid right. hormone to help support because the, the thyroid is so fib fibrotic, meaning those little follicles have been cut open and burst open that now scar tissue has filled them, so the tissue is no longer functional. So they may need some thyroid hormone. Um, number two, make sure all those infections are assessed, right? Um, Again, it's everyone's right to be infection free. So we gotta go test and make sure you're infection free. And then after that, we can do some nutrient testing, whether it's organic acids or various other micronutrient tests to make sure the nutrients are dialed in and get the gut working better. So again, if people are like, oh my God, where do I start? You know, start with your, you know, your blogs and your information. If people want their handheld more, they can reach out to myself over at justinhealth.com. Check out the podcast. I'm available for patients worldwide. Myself and my colleagues, we, you know, I have some people that also so help me as well with customizing and dialing in these comprehensive functional medicine approaches. Awesome. This was an incredible interview, Dr. Justin. Thank you so much for being on. It's really been an honor to have you, and I know people have gotten a ton of value out of this. Dr. Jockers, I appreciate it, and thank you for putting all this information out there. Absolutely. And so if you're out there and you've gotten a lot of value out of this uh, interview and some of the other interviews in our Keto Edge Summit, we would be honored if you considered purchasing this for your own use so you could have it in your video library, listen to these interviews multiple times so you can really start to apply this ketogenic lifestyle, doing it appropriately so you can get that super edge in life that we've talked about, really that keto edge lifestyle and uh, just live your best life. And we'd be honored if you did that and we will see you on another interview.